that anthropologists have been protesting against. Um, I think that as anthropologists, we ought to be saying that actually the future is all about kinship and descent. These are classic anthropological themes. When we think about the future, why do we immediately sort of reach out for our technological uh, wizardry instead of saying, no, we have to think about what the future will be in terms of, of, of those fundamental forces of life that we've always known in anthropology, that is kinship and descent. And that's why I come back to, to the question of, of generations and rethinking generations. Because we know from anthropology, from anthropological research, that this idea of generations replacing one another like layers in a stack is rather new. It doesn't go back more than maybe three or four centuries. It's um, related to all sorts of things like the formation of nation states and the ways in which states have become responsible for children's education, the way in which education has been taken out of the responsibilities and circles of the family. All of these things are, 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 are behind this way of thinking about generations. And we know that throughout most of history, children have been educated have learned what they need to learn by participating in the everyday life of the household. We know that, that grandparents have been the most important educators of children and have been for, for the greater part of human history. So maybe we have something to learn from that. And it seems to me that one of the, uh, turning to the question of education, that one of the great tragedies of modernity has been to split young people and old people apart. Yeah. So that young people are in preschool or before school, they're, they're, they're in their, their kindergarten, old people are, are supposed to be retired, um, and, and they cannot come together to make history. And, and so I think you know, what yeah. we need to be campaigning for is a complete rethink about what we mean by education and about how education is done. And this would be a rethink that would allow young people and old people to work together in forging a future for all of us. Uh, it, was a, it was a complete overturning of the current arrangement in which young neither young people nor old people have any part to play in so-called making history at all. I think, I think that's where the tragedy lies. And I really think that anthropology, instead of, instead of us anthropologists trying to catch up with all the technology stuff and think, oh, we can contribute to science, and we should be saying, no, we anthropologists, we know about fundamental things like kinship and descent. And, and that's what matters if we're going to think about human possibility in the long term. Now, that's my answer. Yeah. Thanks, 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 Professor. Uh, it's the time for the other people. If you want to make the questions to the Professor Tim Gold, it's open. You you open your your micro and you talk and you make the questions, please. Uh, well, I would like to to ask a question if if this is okay. Okay. Please. Okay. Well, well, I I would like to ask Professor Tim Ingold. Um, well, in, in this, in this um, view of this uh, developing of, of, um, of historical process between generations, how, how into, he integrates uh, or how he considers the concept of Bourdieu's of habitus. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I, 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 I find Bourdieu's own concept of habitus um, rather limiting, but I do think that we, ha um, we need to rescue the concept of habit. The, the, the reason why I find Bourdieu's concept rather limiting is because, oh, sorry, let me start again, um, that, that we, we've inherited a particular problem from, from social theory, which is that we understand um, 
we, we, we kind of we, we, we split human consciousness or even human being or no i'll start again <laughs> we, we tend to think of the human being as a kind of pillar or a column with layers up at the top and layers down at the bottom and up at the top is verbal consciousness articulate speech uh, all those things which we can be very explicit about and down at the bottom of the column are our habits um, things that have, have sort of settled or deposited uh, deep inside us to the extent that there are things we do without thinking that, that are beyond the scope of words and that we learn as Bodhya argued through, we learn simply through an implicit pedagogy. Now I think this, this kind of split of the human being between what we can say verbalization and embodiment is wrong. I, 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 and um, ju justice is the idea that goes with it of, of, of um, tacit knowledge. The idea, for example, that the, not, that, um, that the craftsman is unable, who, who is very skilled at, at, at working with things, that he, the, the craftsman who has this, what Bodhi would call this habitus, uh, a set of, 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 um, of dispositions that, uh, that beautifully prepares him for his particular craft, but he can't, because this knowledge is, is, is down here, he can't speak of what he knows. And yet craftsmen can speak perfectly well of what they know. And I think this, this way of talking about the habitus as a sediment, as an embodied sediment that lies beyond words, actually is a way of, 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 um, of, of leaving all those people, all those skilled craftsmen, all those indigenous people without any voice at all. It's actually a rather nasty piece of academic colonialism, which says that only we who can articulate our, our ideas in beautiful speech and write books like uh, Towards a Theory of Practice, uh, we are the only ones who have a voice. Everybody else is voiceless. Their knowledge is tacit. They can't speak for themselves. That I think is wrong, and I think it's been a it's been a, a, a blight on social theory, which is still continuing in much of the discourse of embodiment, which actually does leave people voiceless. Uh, but on the other hand, I think it's very important to restore an idea of habit, uh, and I found much more interesting ideas about habit from among others, John Dewey, but many other writers as well, uh, than from Bodhya. And, and the, the, the paradox about habit is whether we form habits or whether habits form us, uh, uh, whether we are in front of our habits or behind them, so to speak. But if we think of habit in a generative way, in a virtuous sense, the way in which as we form our ways of doing them, we are inside the very processes that we are forming. That, um, that we're not outside them directing affairs, but that we are inside what we do, both forming ourselves and being formed in the process. Then we can have a generative sense of habit, which I think could be very important as a counterweight to the absurd emphasis in much social theory on agency. I think um, habit is a much better term than agency in many ways, but that's another, another issue. So I don't want to go back to Bourdieu uh, or, or to Mauss, of course Bourdieu took the concept of habitus from, from Marcel Mauss in the first place, um, but I do want to rescue the idea of, of habit uh, as something that is not just so automatisms, things you do without thinking, but as something much more, much more fundamental to the way we are in the world, the way we inhabit the world. We inhabit the world through, through habits, and, and that I think is really important. Thank you, Professor. More people want to make questions to the Professor Timon Gold. You open your, your micro and you make the questions.
Professor, about this, this relation between uh, generations, I have um, some work with uh, young people about uh, the um, cultural heritage and the, we made meetings between uh, young people and uh, grandfathers and we had this experience of, uh, of, um, of this dialogue and in the, in the process, it's a process of life, this, this organization, I see some, some, uh, some uh, new ideas, new, 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 new process, new, 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 for example, the people, they, they are a different idea of the, of the future, of the, of the past, mm -hmm. and their, their, their relation in these meetings, they discover other possibilities, other, other histories. I think mm -hmm. it's so important in this, um, this, uh, this, this life process is one way of, uh, we we see the future in not in the way of a totalitarianism. There, there are different ways to make the future. Mm -hmm. I, I like very much the the, the, the idea of the Michel Serto when he talk about possibilities. No, he he he, he, he don't like the the domination of one one true one theory one one mm -hmm. only theory. We talk about, for example, Foucault or other people. No. And this process, your, 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 your explanation is so important because they are the, the, is the way of the freedom of the, the, the capacity of discussion. And this mm -hmm. is so, so, so important. I, I, I like very much this, 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 this possibility of freedom of new, new, uh, new, uh, new ways of made the, the world and the, the, the participation, this meeting of cultural heritage is perhaps the, 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 the most important experience of interpretation of the future, no? Because not, nothing is, uh, don't have the past, nothing. Mm. Oh, absolutely, and we had exactly the same experience, so I, uh, not myself personally, but a colleague, a close colleague of mine who's been working with, uh, with, with uh, people suffering from dementia, or, or supposed to be suffering from dementia, but who actually uh, were, 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 were craftspeople, were basket makers and fishermen when they were young and, and have all these skills about how to make and mend baskets and nets and so on. They, they still have all this knowledge. And you then bring in kids, eight, nine, 10 years old, and, and they're completely in, entranced that, that, uh, that, 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 that the, the things that, that come out of these meetings you you would never expect yeah, and yeah. and it's tremendously productive and and it's an, a source of huge pleasure for those younger people to feel that they're able to experiment with and even innovate with things which nevertheless are continuous with the values of the past that it, i think it's a mistake to think that young people simply want to break with the past and have nothing more to do with it actually they, they, there's a real, that have a sense that, that you can pick something up from what, maybe not your parents, but what, from what your grandparents were doing and pull it forward is something that gives, gives huge satisfaction yes. and, uh, and enjoyment. And I think those are things we should, yeah. we should value. We have one question here. Uh, in the in the well, is in for time. you, Professor Tim. What is the main difference between the perceptions of the environment and <laughs> the image of real? <laughs> of real? Right. Um, well, well, what what main difference is that I wrote it. To, 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 it consists of things written twenty years later. But <laughs> but the, the 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 important thing is that um, when I was writing the perception of the environment. I was trying to uh, develop an approach to how people perceive and live in the world around them, which would not mean having to cut humans off from the rest of the world. So it would, I wanted a way of talking about perception that would work for non-human animals as well as for humans that wouldn't require us to split off a domain of culture from a domain of nature that one could simply talk about uh, relations between living beings and their environment and well they may be human they may not be human 
it doesn't matter. And, and I wanted to try and find a way of, of integrating ecological psychology, ecological anthropology, phenomenology, and so on, around that theme. And, and my readers, people who, who read my work critically, said, this is all, we like what you're doing, this is all very good, but where would you put imagination in your theory? You know, they, say you, they would say, you've got a very nice theory of perception here, uh, we, we, we like it, but, but, but humans imagine things, don't they? They have all this symbolism and, and, and semiotics and stuff. So where does that go? And I had to admit that I didn't know. And the problem was I couldn't see how to bring imagination back in without re, um, without, without uh, resorting once again to these divisions between humans and the rest of the world, which I had tried so hard to, to break away from. Now, how can, you, how can you bring imagination back in without saying, well, actually, humans are different <laughs> because they do all this imagining and this, this somehow sets them apart from the world in a way that is, is not the case for, for other animals. So th th this was the problem. And, and what I tried to do in Imagining for Real it's again a collection, it's a collection of 23 essays and they're on all sorts of different topics, but the, but the, the thing behind them, is, or the, the theme that runs through, is how can, we, how can we imagine imagining, how can we think of imagining in a way that does not force us to draw a line between the world of imagination and the world of real life. So uh, and that's the point about the title, and I call it Imagining for Real. I'm not saying, oh, let's pretend that um, what we're imagining is real. What I, what I mean is how can we find a, a language that can take us beyond this dichotomy between um, imagination and reality? And it comes down to the question again, of perception because when I wrote The Perception of the Environment I had been hev very heavily influenced by the work of James Gibson who I mentioned also in this talk and Gibson has a very static view of the world uh, and it, it's, it's a world of being not a world of becoming and so it, the world is there and the perceiver then has to explore it uh, but in my work since then, I've become more critical of that position and because I wanted to think of the world that is not already there, but rather a world that is, is all the time coming into being around you who are also coming into being. So the whole thing is in process. And I began to see that that's the key. If I can, if I can think of, of, of how you enter into a world that is at, of, at the point of coming into being, could that be what imagining is really about? And um, so that's, that's really where I'm, I'm going with, with the essays. Thank that you, book. thank you, Professor. Uh, more people want to make questions, it's your well, time. Uh, if it's possible, I, I would like, uh, and picking up the words of, of Professor Tim Ingold uh, just now, I would like to hear how he uh, integrates Heidegger's theory of being in the world in this exposition he just made. <laughs> I, I, um, Heidegger was not the only person to talk about being in the world, and 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 I, um, I'm not a Heideggerian. I, uh, I, I, I rather. Um, have taken the line that with, with, with any philosophers, not just Heidegger, but Nello Ponti, Marx, even anybody, anybody you like, um, sometimes they say interesting things and you can draw on the interesting ideas they have and maybe use some concepts without having to go 100% for their whole philosophical scheme. And there's I have to confess that there's a great deal in Heidegger that I still find completely incomprehensible, or if not incomprehensible, he's just going round and round and round in circles, saying basically the same thing um, that he could have said in a few sentences. And this is, this is a problem um, with 
a lot of, of philosophical writing. Um, so um, I'm not a philosopher. Uh, and but but so so the 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 problem I've always had with well there are all sorts of problems with Heidegger but the biggest problem of all of course with Heidegger is that he was absolutely insistent on making humans absolutely different from everything everything else um, his his being in the world could his das ein could only be human. And he could only be human because it was a condition in Heidegger for that being in the world to speak and use language in the way that humans do. And because animals don't have that facility, according to him, they could not be Dasein, which means that they couldn't experience the, 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 curio the, 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 the uncanny nature of existence that humans experience of, of um, that sense that being in the world always calls to mind a profoundly uneasy sense that you're not being in the world at all, that you're somehow completely uh, away from it. Um, it's a sense we can have. Sometimes when you look into yourself and say, here I am, completely alone, completely divorced from anything. And I think, um, I think that this, this is what lies behind, it's this, this angst that lies behind Heidegger's philosopher. I mean, that, that philosophy. I, I, so animals are not supposed to feel anxious or despairing or lonely or anything like that. But humans do because of this predicament of Dasein as being in the world and not being in the world at the same time. I don't want to draw such a strong contrast between um, the human and the non-human. Um, and so I sort of leave off Heidegger uh, at that stage. I wouldn't say that, that what I put forward is a fully fledged theory of being in the world. Um, what I started from rather is what's now become very mainstream in anthropology and that is the idea of relationality. Uh, the idea that, that any being exists and only exists thanks to its being part of a field of relations that binds it or tangles it with all sorts of other beings. Um, and and that, that view is now rather popular, I would say, in today's anthropology. And it doesn't you don't have to depend on Heidegger to, to have it. Um, yes, as somebody said, I don't know whether Heidegger ever had any pet animals. I, I have no idea, but, but um, he was a rather, I, mean, I get the impression that Heidegger was not a pleasant character, not somebody one would have enjoyed yeah. knowing. Um, and uh, I wouldn't be surprised that if he had any animals, he would not be a very, um, he would not have looked after them very well. <laughs> He would probably have forgotten to give them their, their, their food. <laughs> and Professor, the relation between the anthropology and archaeology, for example, if you, you, you talk about this generation, is one stratification, no? The time and mm. other and other, not a relation. But if you look for the work of the, the archaeologists, they are, they, they are this, uh, this uh, stratification of the process in history. And uh, uh, another vision of the relation between different age, different, uh, uh, different um, times, mm -hmm. perhaps is so 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 important for for a new a new uh, a new interpretation of the the, the evidence of the, the archaeological things. No. Yes, absolutely. But the, the, exactly the same issue uh, that I spoke about is is um, exists in archaeology too, and and there are debates about it. That it is it's certainly the case that that stratigraphy has been fundamental to the way archaeology is taught, has been taught and practiced for generations and, and is still fundamental. But there are plenty of critical archaeologists now who are saying that we have to rethink this. Um, I was just thinking of, um, what's his name? Uh, the name's just gone out of my head now, but making um, this person makes a, a distinction between antiquity and pastness. And, and, and it's really 
the same sort of distinction as the one I was making between the, the stack and the braid, that, that, um, that with antiquity, uh, the, the classical sense of antiquity, where you, uh, every, every object you recover from an archaeological site has its particular date, and your problem as an archaeologist is to put these dates in sequence, which came before, first there were this, and then this, and then this, then this, and each thing would have its particular layer in a chronological sequence. But if, if, if everything there is actually has its story, and that story carries on, um, then, um, then you could say that that, that nothing actually has a, a particular date. I mean, the, an example I've used is, imagine, imagine you have uh, in your home a wooden writing desk, a very beautiful desk, uh, that, uh, that is, would be regarded as an antique. And you know that it was made by a carpenter in a particular sound in the year 1653. It was real antique, real beautiful old, old, old furniture. Okay, so, so it belonged to that date. But then you think, why did it belong to that date? Because you're still writing on it now, and lots of people have been writing on it in the past. And then you think, well, actually, this writing desk is made of wood, and, uh, and the wood is still there. So what about the story of the tree from which came the wood from which the writing desk was made? So then you could say, you could actually tell the story of this writing desk that would go back or start from the time when the tree first germinated, from which the wood came, off indefinitely into the future. And, and the um, pastness refers to that ongoing story, rather than the particular moment when something happened, namely a carpenter got to work and put this desk together. Yeah. Um, and of course, it means that there are only, uh, only of certain things, can you say, how old are they? Um, so when I say, how old is this writing desk? Well, three, four hundred years. But that means you're dating it to just a particular thing that happened when the writing desk happened to be made. So you say, how old is a tree? How old is, a, how old is the wind? How old is a, a, a ocean waves? This, there comes a point where these questions don't make any sense. But if one thinks in terms of pastness, then there are all sorts of things that are not part of the archaeological record, because you can't ask how old they are, come back in again. Right. And, and I, I think there are archaeologists who are thinking about that at the moment. Thank you. We have one question for Renata Mota. How do we relate the indigenous cosmovisions that do take other behind into account then? Is Renata? Uh, next, these questions. So, um, yeah, is, is that on the, oh, here is, I got it. How, how do we relate to indigenous cosmovisions that do take Earth of being into account then? How do we relate? We learn from them. I mean, that, so the, 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 um, the point of the view that I've put forward here is very consonant with many indigenous philosophers. I, mean, I referred in passing to um, Australian Aboriginal cosmovisions, referring to, to Fred Myers's classic work on the Pintope. I, I work, referred in passing to uh, Colin Scott, who's worked with the Cree, a, a, um, a First Nations people in, in Canada. And, and the same thing pops up over and over again. And this is um, uh, an idea of that the world is in process, that we are inside a process of creation. Uh, it's not that the world was created and then we're living in it, it's that we're actually living inside this moment of, of creation. And it's a moment of creation in which all beings, everything that's in the world is, is, is um, is caught up in it. Um, so um, it, it, there, there's always a risk then that, that, um, that 
that you you flatten out all these different indigenous visions. I mean, indigenous people do differ <laughs> from one another in the way they think about the world, and 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 it, it it you can't say, oh, there is an indigenous way of thinking about things, because there are as many different ways as there are indigenous people, and they all differ in in certain ways, but. But in some ways, the, the, the really standout way of looking at things is the modern one that seems, seems so odd uh, compared with anything else that went before. Um, so for example, there, there's one essay I wrote um, a few years ago called Dreaming of Dragons, where I was actually exploring parallels between the cosmology of medieval Christianity and um, that of the Ojibwa, who are First Nations people of Northern Canada, and, and the extraordinary similarities. Um, so this idea we have, you know, there's a Judeo-Christian worldview, and then all these indigenous worldviews, they're quite different. That, that, that doesn't work. Um, if, if there's a really clean break, <laughs> it came with, not with Christianity, but with Protestantism. Um, which does seem to have made quite a mark, but this gets into it gets into to, to um, the complicated things. But the um, the attitude I think we should take towards indigenous people and their ways of understanding the world is not to suppose that they've somehow got all the answers already, and that somehow we've got everything wrong, and we need to go back to them, and they'll tell us how things really are but that we should learn from what they have to say in figuring out collectively how to live in the future. And that's a question for all of us, not just for indigenous people, not just for non-indigenous people. It's a question for all the people of the earth. We have, we have to work out how to live. And in doing that, we need all the help we can get. And so we, we, we need to learn from what indigenous people are telling us, just as we need to learn from everybody, everybody else. Okay, Professor, we are another message of Brian. Uh, hi, Tim, you, you, you can read. Yes, I've got it, the layer cake image. Mm. Oh, hello, Brian. On, on the layer cake image, and you sent me a published article or a chapter of yours. Um, Oh, he's just asking. <laughs> I shall, I shall, um, I shall, I have plenty on that. If you say, Brian, send me an email and I will reply to it with something. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you, Brian Ilk, thank you. Uh, if you have more people, you want maybe more questions to Professor Timon Gold. I would like to make a question. Okay, uh, Guilherme. Possible, yeah. And I, I would thank you for your talk. It was extremely interesting. And I would like to go back to the core theme of your topic, which was on uncertainty and possibility. Mm. And um, I was wondering, well, of course, the future is uncertain and it's full of possibilities. But there are a lot of things of which we can be certain, if not in terms of correspondence to reality, at least pragmatically. Mm -hmm. I can do certain things and I can expect certain results mm. uh, and conversely there is also a sense in which possibilities are finite and conditional because although a lot of things are possible not everything is possible i can today be a ceo or maybe a computer engineer but i couldn't be that in the 14th century or in the middle yeah. of the amazon jungle yeah. so i was wondering how do you account for this conditional and finite uh, character of possibility um well, well first of all i um i made this distinction it was rather clumsy um, and might not have been clear but i wanted to distinguish between possibility and possibilities and 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 so um you know uh, uh, you, you could talk to somebody um, who's uh, a young person is wor wor worrying about their career and 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 you're a career <laughs> you're a career's advisor, and you say, well, you could um, you could take this course, or you could train to be a a doctor, or you could train to be a lawyer, or you could be you could do this, or you could do that. And well, it's your choice. You've got to decide what to do, and then and 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 so on. So so that 
know, for anybody at any time, um, life presents them with um, multiple possibilities. And you're absolutely right that those possibilities are nevertheless constrained by historical circumstance. Um, I can't just decide, you know, I, I might decide it would be awfully nice to be um, a, a feudal nobleman, um, but it's just not on at the moment. Yeah. Uh, and, and so it's not part of the, the, the range of possibilities that are available to them. Um, but um, th th those are, prag like you said, pragmatic possibilities. And, and, um, and obviously everybody in life has to make choices and decide. And, and, and the choices we make, there's a path dependency in them. So that if, we, if we decided to go one way, that actually maybe cuts off some other ways. Um, and, and so you can talk about the path dependency in that, in that sense. Uh, but, but all of that is in the, in the realm of, of multiple possibilities. And, and what I wanted to try and get at is a sense of possibility that cannot take, it's not like a menu that doesn't involve a choice between alternatives, but, but, but a pure possibility. It's a bit like pure becoming, the, the actual, um, the, the possibility that life can carry on. <laughs> uh, and, and that's something, that's something, well, in my view, that, that, that's something different. Um, and it doesn't rule out the possibilities, but it, it, um, it's the possibility of, of life itself. I mean, in some ways, I don't think any of us have got beyond your marks in the, uh, in the 18th Brumaire, the famous statement, um, apologies for the way it was put, but man, man, makes his, man, man makes his own history, but not under circumstances of his own choosing, but under circumstances um, that are, uh, are, are uh, taken over uh, from the past. Um, and in a way, you know, everything we write is a footnote to that, that, that we, we do, uh, the history is something we make ourselves, but we can only make it from within. Uh, and, uh, and we can't, we d I don't have the possibility, I don't have the option to imagine that I was born in a different time or place from where I was. So each of us, each of us comes into the world at a particular time in a particular place, and we have no option but to carry on from there. I mean, that's, that's a, that, that's a fact of life. And yet in doing so, we actually create history. We're not simply realizing a range of options that happen to be on the table at that moment. Um, so that's where I think that, that's where undergoing exceeds doing in, in the sense that I was trying to get. And so that there's, it's like there's this extra dimension. Uh, there, there's the dimension, of course, of people doing things, choose, making choices, realizing them, uh, one choice depending on another, only certain things being available for certain people at certain times. But behind all that, the sense that life actually goes on uh, and um, like a relay in which each, each life can take over from the one before which takes over to the next one. And, so that, that's what I was trying to get at. <laughs> I don't know whether it really answers your question, but... Um, Thank you, Guilherme. Thank, Thank you, you, Professor. Thanks. More people who want to make questions? No. Professor Tim Gold. Uh, thank you. We, we, we as Portuguese Society of Anthropology and Ethnology, we are very grateful for your participation, your present year. Is a, is a pleasure, and uh, I wish I wish you a, a nice weekend. Thank you for very much. Uh, I don't know, perhaps no nobody want made more questions. We finish here. I send you the 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 the, the, the friendship of the professor Vitor Vera George is not here, but but he is in their their presence is here. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Let, 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 let me you. wish your, your association another very successful 100 years. Thank you. Thank you. More, more under. More, yeah, thank you. Bye, Professor. Bye. Bye-bye.
Right. Thank you. Thank you.